the things that that's describing and what function does it serve within the text. from the first proof that is removed from the later edition. Okay, what's going on here? What does this describe? What function does it serve? I'm going to take somebody from that side. <coughs> yes? You're saying that by the word, the dramatic irony. Dramatic irony, that's very good. Um, so yeah, we've got this imitation of the father, you've got the son imitating the father, but you've, and you've got the sense of going down the pit, you've got some technical detail of being down in the pit, you've got the sense of it somehow being almost parodic, in some sense it's almost comic, but certainly there's a dramatic irony as well, because he's emulating the father, and it's done within a safe environment, and he can come crawling out, but of course his father's not going to come crawling out, so there's a sense in which that kind of exacerbates the, the kind of sense of foreboding maybe in the story, so it's at once kind of ironic, but also quite Quite sinister. Yeah? Um, I actually thought the uh, daughter was emulating the mother's behaviour because <coughs> the show called on the children to force itself to play. It's like a mother would do maybe uh, at the end of the party to go wrong, change the subject, do something to the person we got. Excellent. Yeah, I think that, that, is, that is a good point. So we've got two things there. We've got one about the yeah the child trying to emulate her mother's behaviour, and in that sense it brings us back to this representation of gender, that you've learnt that position already, but there's also this sense of, of trying to ignore and trying to refuse the impending doom as well. So it's kind of, as I say, building up again that sense of, of foreboding. Yeah, at the back? Um, I think that was more just what might have been, uh, the situation at the time where children, this massive gap between Okay, so we've got, we've got two things going on there. One is that it's kind of saying, well, in fact, the children know what's going on, so the efforts of the mother are, are almost irrelevant. Um, and also we've got a sense, yeah, of a, of a kind of a critique of, of expectations about the relations of parents to children and the historical way in which parents might relate to their children. And does this, in fact, alter the way that we might think about, say, Victorian parenting, this seen and not heard stuff? Because... What one could say is that this is a representation from inside a working class family that's demonstrating a different structure of relations and play. Children at play, I mean, where do you get that outside of the water babies uh, in 19th century literature? It's something that, that from the inside and from a relation to the adult world is something that, that perhaps isn't there very often. Okay, there was no point in back here. Yeah. In a way, I think all that massive paragraph there, because uh, it's so easily summed up in like those three lines, I think it's better for him to do that because such concentrating on the children like and focusing on them, I think it takes away from the mother's experience of it because they seem to be used in the in the penguin version as like a vehicle to show her emotions and like display what's going on, how she tries to protect them and things. And I sort of think that if you focus on them too much, it distracts from that. You've been reading Lawrence's letters, haven't you? I've got no. Well, that's no. I mean, that seems to me that we've moved on to, to what we're saying. Okay, so why does he cut this bit out? Okay, what is it? I mean, it serves all those functions. <coughs> Excuse me. It's got a dramatic irony. It tells us interesting things about the kids. It's actually a bit of light relief. Kids playing, eating a hedgehog. Ho ho. Okay, it's like the comic scene. Um, there are all kinds of things going on there, but Lawrence decides to take them out. Okay, so we've worked out what their function is, but to remove them and to distill that into three lines also tells us a lot about the where there is a shift maybe of emphasis and attention to a particular different focus of significance within the story. If you take out the subplot involving the children, if you take out the children playing, what of course you're left with is a much clearer narrative line which focuses on Mrs. Bates, it focuses on Elizabeth, it focuses on Elizabeth's story, and they be, the children become much more peripheral to that story. You take out some of the more kind of sentimental parts of the story, 
that if you think, well, maybe we're, we're over-egging it a bit to have the poor, innocent children set up as a contrast to this, um, to this gloomy future. And, this, it's a, and also the dramatic irony, is that perhaps a little bit heavy-handed? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't it give it away a bit? If I, if I read that before, because up until the ending, up until when they brought him in and he was dead, I thought, is he going to be dead? Is he not going to be dead? Is his leg going to be sawn off? That, like, you did, I didn't know. But if I read that uh, and saw that the children were playing, I'd draw too much of a comparison between, oh, right. look, how ironic that he's safe and at home. And he's OK, dead. so we've got um, a further thing, which is that, yeah, it might actually dissipate some of the sense of, of gloom because it might, it might point too directly towards what may ultimately be the outcome. We've got another point on that. I think the next stage that one would do, and we're actually up against time now, so I'm not going to do this within this class, but maybe that's a project for the future, would be to trace in this story the different um, descriptions and representations of the children. And you can see that in the, the published version that you have. If you had available to you the earlier version of the first proofs, which may one day happen, you never know, um, and it is available in, in a journal form in the university, you can start making comparisons about the way the children are represented in those two different texts. And you can start to draw those conclusions about why Lawrence might have changed things in the second text, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some authority to the first text. The first text was, is still a coherent story and does certain things and could conceivably have been published in that form. So you start to see an earlier emphasis and an earlier set of concerns that to some degree are cleaned up or distilled in the later version, but certainly are still present in the later version in a subdued form. So, so it's, it's very true that, that that early version allows us to see a Lawrence that's still working out what's my primary focus in this story? What is it that I really want to talk about? And we can see what he goes on to do, but that doesn't mean that all those other things aren't parts of who Lawrence is and what he's trying to do. So we're seeing a development of the writer in those changes, but we're also able to concentrate our sense of what happens in the story that we have in front of us by seeing that these particular lines have been taken out. And if we talk about all the functions that they served and the way that, um, that they've been removed, that allows us to say, OK, within the genre of the short story and within this particular short story, Lawrence is attempting to focus more clearly on Elizabeth. He's attempting not to have heavy-handed dramatic irony. Uh, he's attempting not to have kind of any little comic subplots, and in that sense, he's slimming the story down to give it a particular focus. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so I'll click forward. Um, that's the text we've just seen. Okay, the ending of the text is something that has changed even more radically. Okay, the excision of the children and the way that the children are removed is a very significant change to the text. What you have on your sheet there is the March 1910 proofs, the first proofs version of the ending. As you can see from the screenshot on the right, Lawrence wasn't very pleased with this ending because basically he rubs the whole thing out. Okay? And he rubs it out and then over the next three years there are in fact significant differences again between what he publishes in the English Review and what he finally publishes in the Prussian Officer Collection. And so one of the kind of major tasks of a critic is you can read that final version that you've got in your book in the Prussian Officer and you think, oh, that's difficult and that's a long passage and wow, what's he getting at there? To look back at the first version, you'll find that it's almost, uh, it's almost a different story altogether. He's moved away from a lot of the things that he's saying there. If you look at the interim text, okay, which is this one, uh, which doesn't show up very well on the screenshot there, uh, on the paper, this is what comes out in the English Review. So we've already corrected from that slide from a couple of months ago. He crosses out that ending and rewrites the ending that's here. This ending is different again in many different ways from the ending that's in your book now. 
So what you could do would be to compare these three texts and from that to see what is the emphasis that he's trying to achieve in the final. So it stops you having to kind of think, okay, I'm just going to sit here with the ending and see what happens. When you're comparing, it throws into relief the sort of choices that a writer is making, the sort of things that he's adding and the sort of things that he's taking away. And what's particularly significant is that within this middle version, the English Review, this is the only point within the story where we start to get an authorial voice and we start to get personification.